OK. So today is actually perhaps the most important lecture, at least for the topic of quantum computing. So you know, get your thinking cap on. So if you remember all the way back to lecture two, I was trying to tell you sort of like, what is the one thing a quantum computer can do? Like, what's this one real power? And I described it as you know, finding patterns in implicitly represented data. And that's what we're going to talk about today. And specifically uh, today, like last time, in fact, we're going to be talking about what one might call XOR patterns. So I'll explain what that means over the course of this lecture. So what's the picture that you often have in, in life, in, uh, I don't know, data processing? You have some data vector of length n. And I'm going to write capital N here. And you know, you want to find out some stuff about patterns in it, so you do a Fourier transform. And this Fourier transform, there are different kinds of Fourier transforms. We're going to be talking about like a Boolean one today. But it's essentially, it's going to be based on, I'll explain all these things, some capital N different pattern vectors. Not really a standard term, but call it that. And after that, what do you get out? You get out another length N vector. Where the you know the s entry is somehow like the strength of you know the s pattern from over here in the data. It's a very common phenomenon just in any old I mean data processing uh, scenario. Let me put some notation to this. Uh, I'm going to, you know, this is a length n vector, so I'm going to call it g. We'll use quantum notation. And let's say it's a, a, a vector list of complex numbers. Usually going to be real numbers, but let's say complex numbers. And I'm going to call the pattern vectors here uh, chi. So chi 0, chi 1, up to chi uh, n minus 1. OK, and these are also vectors that somehow represent the patterns. And here I mean you know, the strength of the s pattern. I mean the s one of these. I'll make this more precise in a moment. Uh, but what's cool is that um, you know, in a classical scenario, you do this all the time, but like n is of you know, physical size. I mean, you actually have these vectors you know, explicitly stored on your hard drive or your piece of paper. Maybe capital N is 100 or 1,000 or maybe a million. And then you know, this is some kind of uh, linear transformation, as we'll see, and you, you explicitly get out the length n vector at the end. But the cool thing about quantum is uh, we do this with um, you know, capital N being 2 to the little n where little n is of physical size. So you know, in the quantum scenario like this, capital N might be 2 to the power of 100, or 2 to the power of 1,000, or 2 to the power of a million, if you can get a million qubits together, um, which is amazing. I mean, if you can really do it, uh, you can find um, patterns in like, data that's only implicitly represented and you know, is of size that could not be explicitly represented in our universe. Uh, OK, so what do I mean by this part, or these pattern vectors? Well, actually, in general, you can make different choices here. And the most general scenario, um, these chi's can literally be any orthonormal basis for n-dimensional space. OK, so any. Uh, length and complex vectors that uh, have unit length and are mutually perpendicular. And then this transformation, 
it's really nothing more than like taking this data vector and expressing it in this different basis. Okay, so these are, this is my picture for a basis, an orthonormal basis. It's taking some vector here and just writing it in a different basis, a rotation of the standard basis. And these strengths are nothing more than like the coefficients of this vector in this basis. Okay, that's all I mean by these words. Okay, so like maybe here's a, some kind of picture in, in literally two dimensions. This is like the standard basis. But then perhaps this is the, you know, the chi basis, the pattern basis. Okay, and you might have some like data vector here, g, and you might know its coordinates in the standard basis. And then this Fourier transform is really just working out like, well, what are, what are these, these quantities? You know, it's, it's coefficients in the new basis. So these, you know, strengths, I just mean the, the coefficients of the G when represented in the chi basis. And there's nothing um, magical about this. I mean, we talked way back in lecture three when we reminded ourselves about linear algebra, what are these quantities? You know, this S strength, if you will, since these chi's are assumed to be, you know, unit vectors, it's just the, like the dot product of G with each of the chi's. Okay, so the strength is of, you know, this pattern, if you will, is, I've got to remember to do it in the right order. I think I want this. Okay, so this is the inner product between G and uh, chi S. And sometimes, especially when this orthonormal basis, chi S, is a very special or particular basis, as it will be in today's lecture, sometimes this is denoted G hat S. And it's called the Fourier coefficient of G. But this is the same meaning as this. It's how important, you know, pattern or vector chi s is to vector g. Okay, so this Fourier transform is really nothing more than like putting, uh, you know, transforming the standard basis into this basis of chi's. So let's write down a little bit more for that. So let's let, um, U be the n by n matrix uh, whose columns are the chi's. So first of all, U is a unitary matrix. Precisely because the chi's are orthonormal. That's one definition of a unitary matrix. Its columns form an orthonormal basis. And what does U do? I mean, U just maps the standard basis to the chi basis. I mean, if you have any matrix, right, the first column is the vector that uh, the first standard basis vector goes to, the second column is the, the vector that the second standard basis goes to, and so forth. Um, so actually, if you think about it, if we want to take a vector in the sort of the standard basis and figure out, you know, its coefficients in the chi basis, then actually we have to do u inverse. Um, actually, so we actually kind of want to do this. here. But I must admit that like every time I write this down, I have to think about like, well, is it U or is it U inverse? And like 99% of the time, it doesn't really matter. In particular, today we're going to spend, uh, you know, all our time talking about uh, the Hadamard transform where these are like kind of XOR functions like last time. And in that case, like U is going to be the same as this inverse. So we don't have to worry about this distinction, but I'll try to get it right. Um, by the way, since U is uh, unitary, this is also U dagger, in other words, the conjugate transpose of u. Okay, and so what goes on in this picture? 
Um, you know, as I said, here you have some g. It's like some length 2 to the n vector of data. OK, and you apply u inverse or u dagger, it doesn't matter. And call that a Fourier transform. And what comes out is the coefficients of g in this new basis. And we could write them even like this. g hat 0, g hat 1, all the way to g hat n minus 1. These are the coefficients of g in the um, basis of chi. So you can think of it as like, you know, how important each of the chi patterns is in g. OK, any questions about this? So in particular, I should say that like, you know, this also means that uh, you know, g as a vector is the sum over all uh, s that index the, the pattern vectors of this number times uh, chi s. Okay, it's just writing g in this new basis. Okay, so this is actually a very general setup, and you can like you know have this interpretation or this idea for literally any orthonormal basis, so it's like literally any unitary um, matrix U. Uh, but you know one typically focuses on some very specific uh, examples of chi's, and in this course we'll mainly focus just on two, one of which we'll talk about today. Um, okay, so there's some particular cases for the these pattern vectors, if you will. And you want two things about them. First of all, you know, these should be like somehow interesting or useful. I mean, you could do this routine or think about this, you know, transforming a data vector into some other orthonormal basis, but it should have some meaning, this other orthonormal basis, or otherwise, what's the point? And another thing that's important for the purpose of quantum computing is that, you know, this associated change of basis matrix, U, should be, or maybe more precisely, U dagger should be easy to compute by quantum gates because we're going to be in the quantum story like literally implementing this transformation u. So it should be easy to compute by a quantum circuit. And so today, we're going to focus on one specific case. And um, this is the case where these chi's are these, uh, basically the XOR functions we saw last time. I'll, I'll remind you of all this stuff. But uh, these patterns are going to be useful because they're going to be you know, XOR patterns. They're going to be kind of seeing how Boolean functions can be represented as combinations of XOR functions. And what's particularly great about uh, this choice for the chi's is this is super, super simple. So here, this u is just the nth tensor power of the Hadamard matrix. So it's literally to affect this uh, change of basis, you just do a Hadamard gate to each qubit in your story. So later, we're going uh, to spend some time with this example, this kind of Boolean Fourier transform. And later, we'll get into a more number theory kind of Fourier transform. This is, in fact, the most standard discrete Fourier transform. It'll be the one that gets used in, in Shor's factoring algorithm. And in this case, the patterns, well, they'll be a little bit less pleasant. They'll be kind of like discrete sines and cosines. or um, It'll be based on like powers of roots of unity. 
Maybe you've seen this before in a discrete Fourier transform. Uh, so that'll be good for number theory. And then this part, actually computing this by a quantum circuit, it's like a little bit more annoying. Like it takes like half a lecture to explain how to do it. Um, but it can be done. So we'll come to that in good time, but uh, today we'll focus on the easiest case. Okay, so I mentioned that, um, I think I've said in words a few times that, you know, in today's case, these XOR patterns will be, or these patterns or, or chi vectors will be XOR functions. And that might sound a little weird, uh, but it's something you'll have to get used to. So uh, I want to start by saying that um, for the purpose of this whole discussion, there's like a very, very important like mental perspective you need to take. Um, in this scenario when, you know, capital N, the length of these vectors that we're talking about is a power of two. Um, so this crucial mental perspective is to think of uh, vectors and functions as the same object. And it's also the same object as a quantum state. So let me put this up here on the board. OK, so one kind of object that I've been talking about so far in this lecture is just like a vector, like a super tall vector of full of complex numbers. OK, so this is a vector in C capital N. But I also want you to simultaneously think of this object in a different way. You should also somehow think of it as the quote unquote truth table of a Boolean function, but not even the kind of Boolean function you're normally used to. I want you to think of it as like the truth table of a function uh, that maps um, n bit strings to complex numbers. Okay. Most normally, you're used to thinking of a function mapping n bit strings to a bit. Now, please think of a function more generally as mapping n bit strings to complex numbers. And, you know, what's a truth table normally? You kind of list out all the possible inputs x here. These are length n Boolean strings. And then next to it, you list f of x which in a normal quote unquote truth table is a bunch of zeros and ones. But now, more generally, it can be just some complex numbers, which for some reason I'm denoting by a squiggle. OK, and this is a height capital N, right? The cardinality of this is uh, capital N, 2 to the n. It's a height capital N, you know, list of numbers. And its, it's, um, it's entries are indexed by the 2 to the little n Boolean strings. OK, and so it's also just a vector, but so it's the same object. It's, you should think of the coordinates of the vector as being indexed by the Boolean strings. Why are we calling this a truth table? Well, I mean, uh, it's a table. And uh, yeah, it's like a value table. I'm just so you know, if, if this happened to have range 0 and 1, like one is used to in computer science or electrical engineering, then this object would be called the truth table. You know, you write down the the strings, and then you write down the value of the function. Yeah, just making sure. Yeah. And at, you know, on the third hand, at the same time, one can also, uh, up to an issue of normalization, which I'll get to in a second, one can also also think of this object as a little n qubit state. Because really, what is a quantum state? So what is, you know, the definition of such a state, you know, it's, it's defined by two to the little n amplitudes. You know, it's like some amplitude on the all zero string plus some other amplitude, which is a complex number on the next string plus some, I oh, can't draw this squiggle, some two to the nth amplitude on the all one string. OK, there's a bit of a difference here because these 2 to the n numbers, their magnitude squares have to add up to 1. But aside from that, like these are all three the same kind of object. And it's really important for this lecture, mainly this one, to like pass in your mind back and forth between vectors 
and like a function. Function mapping uh, strings into complex numbers. Actually, there's a really annoying um, issue here with the, the normalization. So, of course, a quantum state has to be a unit vector. In the sense that these magnitude squares have to add up to 1. Okay, that's fine. I mean, so let's just associate with the unit vector in Cn. This is like a little less you know, natural to impose on like a function. I mean, what are you saying here? The sum of the squares, the values of the functions is 1. It's a little bit weird. Um, especially because, you know, we're ultimately motivated by computing. And so like, we're going to be mainly motivated by the case when this function f is somehow like computing a, a Boolean function. So we kind of have to like fit, you know, the normal Boolean functions or like the, the, the truth tables where these are zeros and ones, we have to like fit them into this picture. And I'll show you how to do this. Um, it's just a little bit annoying. So like we, we talked about it partly last time when we talked about sign implementation. So let's say you have some, you know, genuine Boolean function mapping n bit strings to one bit strings, capital F that you care about. Well, if you just kind of write its truth table down, Sure, it'll be a length capital N vector, but it won't satisfy this normalization condition. So one thing you can do to make things a little bit better is replace it by like the plus or minus version of it. Okay, so if this is F, you could write down this, which I'll call little f, which is minus 1 to the power of capital F. Okay, so it's basically the same thing. It's just in the output, you're encoding your true and false by plus and minus rather than 0 and 1. That's not a, a big difference. And this is the, like the trick that we employed a little bit when we talked about sign implementing functions by quantum circuits. Yeah? Yeah, like what's wrong with just normalizing, just dividing by, by, a num by some number? This one? Yeah. Well, we're going to normalize this one. And uh, the reason it's more convenient to normalize this rather than this is you have to divide by a different number in each case, right? Like the amount you have to divide by here depends on how many entries are 1. Um, which actually eventually we're just going to deal with that too. But uh, it's, it's a little neater in this case when all the entries are plus or minus 1. Because then this thing always has length square root of capital N, right? The square root of the sum of the squares of the entries. Since they're all plus or minus 1, it's capital N is the sum of the squares of the entries. So if you further do this trick, and normalize it by root capital N, then this will be a unit vector no matter what the Boolean function capital F was. And that's great because like now this kind of thing on one hand, up to this like annoying of this root N and the fact that you switch to plus or minus notation, you know, it, it, it can stand for any good old Boolean function, which is good. That's the sort of thing we like to study in computing. But it's also a unit vector, and therefore it can be thought of as a, a little n qubit state. Um, and this, I'm going to introduce some no, non-standard notation for this. It's my own personal, well, I'm sure other people have used it, notation. I'm going to be writing this as cat f, which looks like a little bit sketchy. I mean, like really overloading notions, because normally we put like bit strings into this ket symbol. And now I'm putting a function into the ket symbol. Um, oh, that's one beauty of the ket symbol. You know, you can put whatever you want into it. It's fine. But let me make this explicitly this non-standard definition, but it's so convenient that I had to make it. Um, let me just, if g is any like complex valued Boolean function, like this kind of function down here, except I called it G. Then this symbol, ket G, shall denote uh, this uh, quantum state. Uh, 1 over root n sum 
or the binary strings g of x, x. Okay? So you would at first think, like, oh, the most normal thing to do is have it denote this. I mean, that's, I don't know, if I give you, this is basically giving you two to then complex numbers. So, like, the most natural way to call that a quantum state would be like this. Uh, but I'm going to, like, build the one over root n into the definition. You didn't do the sign thing, right? No, I'm going to use this notation potentially even when g is not necessarily of this form. I mean, it's not. Oh, yeah, actually, this need not be a quantum state. I mean, it is a quantum state if g's, that's a property that the sum of the squares of its you know, values is, yeah. So, okay, let me just say the vector then. That's a good point. I mean, I think I'm only going to employ it when it's going to be a quantum state, because otherwise it would be confusing. It's already a little bit confusing, um, but yeah. And as I said last time, like, I'm going to try to get everything correct, but like, basically, the better thing to do really would just to simply never stress about this like, normalizing, normalizing factor. And if you have an object that you want to be a quantum state, and like, it's accidentally not because its squared magnitudes don't sum to 1, then just treat it as the thing that you would get had you normalized it so that its squared magnitudes add up to 1. Actually, if you do that, everything will be fine. But I'll try to do it you know, properly and keep the root ends everywhere. Okay. So in fact, let's say uh, let, let's let's take up this last point that was mentioned. But really, this is going to be a very critical mental perspective for this lecture and future lectures. So you you really got to get used to this to simultaneously think of quantum states as vectors, but also as functions. Actually, let me just say what I, I said in response to the question. So, um, yeah, this is a quantum state. If and only if, okay, the sum of the squares of the magnitudes of the amplitudes, amplitudes should be 1. So what is that? Well, it's 1 over capital N, sum over x, magnitude g, oops, g of x squared equals 1. I like to think of this quantity as um, the average over x, a Boolean string, of gx squared. OK, so this is going to be a quantum state if the average squared value of g is 1. As it is if g is of this form. G is like has range plus or minus one because then actually G squared is always one. So in particular, its average is, is one. Uh, say this happens in particular if G is like a, a Boolean function in this way. So if, if G is equal to like this little f, which is minus 1 to the capital F, where f is a Boolean function. And one thing you can recall, and you know, I'll remind you of this again later, but I'll also remind you of it now. Um, this is the kind of thing that we were encountering last time in the whole like rotate, computate, rotate, compute, rotate setup of, of Simon. Right, so last time we were seeing these um, circuits where you know, we put in some zeros, and then we'd pass these through Hadamard gates. And the point of that was to generate the uniform superposition uh, namely this object. And then we were last time imagining passing this through the sign implementation of a Boolean function. And if you recall, the state that came out is actually exactly this thing that we're now calling ket f. Basically, because the point of this circuit was to map 
x to minus 1 to the f of x cat x. Okay, if you do that, then what you get out is precisely this when little g is little f. Okay, so that's why you know, one reason, like, I you know, introduced this notation and we're going to be using it a lot because, like, this is like the main first move in quantum computation, or first and second moves, this rotate compute, like, you know, get something, you know, you have, this is basically a classical circuit, but it has the property that it can accept superposition. So it can give you somehow superpositions of answers. And so, you know, the classic move is you make the uniform superposition, you plug it in, and you get to this quantum state, cat f, that has all the answers to the Boolean function, like encoded in the amplitudes. Okay, so now, uh, since we now have this crucial mental perspective where vectors are also functions, if you go back to the stuff that we were talking about at the beginning where we had these pattern vectors, chi 0 through chi n minus 1 that we cared about, these can also be thought of as functions. In this uh, scenario we were talking about, these pattern vectors, which were any orthonormal vectors, actually. You can also think of them as functions, you know, coming from functions, chi s mapping 0, 1 to the n into the complexes. Okay, so you can also think of them as any orthonormal collection of functions. And okay, so today we're going to talk about a special case, a particular case, the Boolean Fourier transform case. This is where the, uh, the chi s's are what we were calling last time XOR functions. Okay, this means functions which are XORs of subsets of the bits, n bits, and what subset is prescribed by this s. Okay, so these are the functions that take n bits and actually output either minus 1 or plus 1. Uh, so this is a nice case, they output plus or minus 1, where x gets mapped to, well, minus 1 to the power of what we were calling last time, xor sub s of x. Let me leave that up for a moment and come over here. And what is xor sub s of x? This is a genuine Boolean function. It was the sum over all coordinates i where s is 1. I should mention here that s is also a Boolean string. So these pattern vectors, there's two to the little n of them, but they're also indexed by Boolean strings, just as we typically index vectors here, uh, of xi mod 2. Okay, so this is the xor of the bits x in the subset of the coordinates indicated by s. Uh, good. So we'll see these, we'll see later, I'll remind you later, by the way, why these are orthonormal functions. Um, but one thing I want to emphasize here is there's a very unusual and special property of these pattern vectors or pattern functions, these particular XOR ones, which is that they're Boolean valued. That is, except for this 1 over root n, you know, factor at the front, uh, these take value plus or minus 1. So I mean, if you write them down as vectors, like every entry will be plus or minus 
well, 1 over root n. You factor that 1 over root n out, every entry will be plus or minus 1. That's kind of amazing, and it doesn't have to happen, right? I mean, as I said before, these pattern vectors, you can select like any orthonormal set of vectors. So like almost always, like an orthonormal set of vectors, we'll just have like some random, I don't know, like irrational numbers in there. This is like an extremely unusual and special collection of orthonormal vectors where like the entries of the vectors all happen to be plus or minus one. That's really amazing and pleasant, and that's why like this is like, to my mind, the most beautiful and like enjoyable Fourier transform or alternative basis. So question. Mm -hmm. If you think about this function as a function at outputs zero and one, yeah. these functions will not be will not make an orthonormal basis. Correct. But they will be orthonormal when you switch this plus or minus one. Yes. Yeah. Just confusion a little bit. I'll, I'll draw okay. some pictures and examples soon, and it'll hopefully be more clear. For example, I can say this right just this second. Uh, here's a really, really simple example. If n equals 1, so capital N equals 2, there's only two such functions. And uh, Chi zero is this function, this vector. Well, it's one over root two times plus one plus one. So you always take the XOR of the empty set. So like this is just zero, and then minus one to the zero is plus one. And then chi one, and there's really only one coordinate. So now this is the case where you're just like taking that coordinate. So this is indexed by zero, this is indexed by one. If that coordinate is 0, you still have plus 1. If that coordinate is 1, you have minus 1. So like these are the two vectors slash functions in this case. And if you stack them together into a matrix U, well, it looks like this. And that is, by the way, the Hadamard gates. And indeed, this has like orthonormal columns, as you can kind of visually visibly see. Um, yeah, on the other hand, I mean, this is a very special property. If you compare it with, I mean, we haven't seen it yet, but like the quote unquote usual discrete Fourier transform matrix, which hopefully you've seen at some point in your life, which we use in Shor's algorithm, you know, here, you know, you use like pattern matrices that look like this. It's like chi s of x is like e to the 2 pi i over capital N s times x, where now s and x are interpreted as integers. OK, so the, you know, the, the, the range of values for these things, or the entries in the vector, if you think of them as vectors, are like some complex numbers that are not particularly pleasant. But here it's so awesome, they're, they're, they're bits. So like, usually the data vectors that we care about come from Boolean functions, so we represent them with a bunch of pluses and minuses. And now we have this even cool thing that like the pattern vectors that we're like, you know, making, you know, they're we're evaluating how much strength each pattern vector has for our data vector are also Boolean functions. They're these nice XOR functions. OK, so I am going to soon dive into like this special case of uh, these XOR functions and particular pattern vectors. But I decided that like since I was still at the level of generalities and we're eventually going to have to talk about a different example, I'd still do a few more things in the level of complete generality. So pardon me for staying at a high level for so long. But now I just want to go back and um, revisit this, this notion of like, you know, the strength of pattern chi s in a given data vector g. But just think of both of them as functions. And so now it's like, oh, we should think about like, what is the strength of uh, this pattern function chi s in this function for this function g. So what is it like the strength of this pattern function 
in G. Well, remember, it's just the, if you think about these as vectors, it's like the coefficient of this vector when written in the basis of these vectors. And as we saw before, it's, it's just this, chi s inner product with G, when these are thought of as vectors. And I also said, oh, if you, you want, you can introduce this notation. Um, good. So let's just write it in function notation. So, um, okay. Well, first let's expand it in, in vector notation, and we'll see how to think about it in terms of functions. We have to write down this uh, bra here. So it's like the row vector version of this, also with complex conjugates, but don't pay too much attention to that. So it's 1 over root n times like chi s of zeros, complex conjugate, but don't worry about that too much. And then the last entry here will be chi s of all ones, complex conjugate. OK, so here, what are we doing? I'm using the fact, I'm thinking of chi s as a function, but now I'm using this like notation that I just erased where like, cat of a function represents, you list off all those functions' values and also throw in a factor of 1 over root n. And then I, I brought it, so I like made it into a row vector, and I also had to put in these complex conjugate symbols. But like, don't worry about them too much, because like in you know, the case that we're going to think about today, these chi's are plus or minus values, so complex conjugating doesn't do anything. You need to use them, because eventually we'll have this scenario, and it'll make a minus sign up here. But Never mind. OK, and same thing for g. So g is like, you know, by our weird notation, we have this 1 over root n in there. And then we write the truth table of g, which it's hard for you to see. But this is g of all zeros, g of all ones. OK, we're doing an inner product here. So then we multiply it out. And what do we get? We get 1 over capital N. The two 1 over root n's come together. And then we get the sum over all strings x. 0, 1 to the n, chi s of x star times g of x. And I like to think of this as the average, again, the average. This is like an average. Average over x, a Boolean string, of chi s of x, OK, with a conjugate if you want, times g of x. OK, so this quantity, the strength of the pattern chi s, to this pattern function chi s in G, is this. Okay, it's the average value of chi s times G. Sometimes I think of this as like the correlation between chi s and G. Okay, it's somehow like a correlation average value of the product. This thing, g hat s, you know, the correlation of chi s and g. It's particularly nice in this case that we're seeing today where chi s takes plus or minus one values. So if g takes plus or minus one values, just the case we care about most, our data vector is coming from a Boolean function with this little plus or minus one trick. And our chi s's also take plus or minus one values, which they do in this case where we're using the, the Boolean Fourier transform. And these chi s's are these pattern, these XOR functions. Then this is like even more gloriously enjoyable. Um, Because in this case, what is this g hat s? Well, this is plus or minus 1. This is plus or minus 1. So if you multiply two plus or minus 1s, it's plus 1 if they're the same and minus 1 if they're different. So this is the average over all Boolean strings x of like plus 1 if g of x equals chi s x and minus 1 if they don't equal. OK, 
And this is really even more it feels like a correlation. It's like how similar the function g is to the, sim the function chi s. You know, you look overall and average over all the inputs. Are they the same or are they equal? And average this up with plus 1 and minus 1. OK, so it's really it's like the fraction of x's where g of x equals chi s of x minus the fraction of x's where they're not equal. This is just equal to, uh, to correlation. Right? Yeah, it's equal to correlation in the statistics sense, yeah. If you think of like g of x and chi s of x as random variables where x is the randomness. OK, so this is like really great. You know, it's the difference of these two fractions. It's a number between minus 1 and plus 1. It's plus 1 if g and chi s are literally the same function. It's minus 1 if g is literally the negation of chi s. And in general, you know, it's supposed to measure like the strength of this chi s xor function as a pattern in g. Well, it's just, you know, it, it goes up linearly from minus 1 to 1, depending on like how, what fraction of entries in their truth tables they agree on. Okay, so it's a, it's a very sensible quantity. OK, so. Let's now kind of like redraw the picture we drew last time. So last time we kind of did this rotate, compute, rotate thing where we had a assigned implementation of a function. You know, we cooked up the uniform superposition, passed it through the sign implementation of the function. That kind of like loaded up the function's values to the end values into a quantum state. And then we passed it through like Hadamard gates. Just did this like Hadamard transform. And then I'll remind you of this, but like, you know, some like miracle happened if, if the function itself happened to be an XOR function and we saw like a cool trick that you could do with quantum computing. So I'll recap that uh, here. But in general, I'll just recap the, the use of this Fourier transform in quantum computing. Okay, so again, this is a very common paradigm in quantum computing. You get together n qubits. And you pass them through the Hadamard uh, gates. And the point of doing this was just, it was a way to like cook up the uniform superposition, which is the state that, like this. It's sort of a coincidence that like this is also going to be the discrete Fourier transform that we're going to study today, the Hadamard transform. Sort of not a coincidence, but the main thing to focus on is just, OK, you prepare the uniform superposition of all uh, strings. And then we imagine that you had some Boolean function capital F. And you had like a classical circuit for it. And uh, we saw that once you had that, you could convert the classical circuit with not too much difficulty into like a, a quantum circuit that did the same thing as the classical circuit on, on classical inputs, but also could accept superpositions of inputs. And then there's this little uh, other trick that we did so that the way it did its computation was in this, this sign way. And what popped out after you did this was 1 over uh, root n sum over x f of x at x, where this is minus 1 to f of x. And this is the thing that we're now calling ket f. So this initial part of like uh, the algorithm from last time and like the algorithm in many, many quantum algorithms, such as they are. Um, you can really think of this as like kind of loading up the data into a quantum state. Okay, if you want to think of all the quantum algorithms as like finding patterns and implicitly representing data, like these steps like get you to the part where you've like implicitly represented your data in a quantum state. There's actually other ways to do it. Uh, we're going to see in subsequent lectures like slightly different beginnings that get kind of like a implicitly represented classical data into a quantum state, especially in the case where you have a Boolean function that has multiple output bits. 
then this is not really the most appropriate way to do it, but it won't be very different. And we'll see that later. Okay. And then, you know, the next aspect of the most common quantum computing paradigm, the second rotate and rotate, compute, rotate, is to put it through a discrete Fourier transform. And this is the one we're going to be talking about today. Okay. This is, uh, you know, I've written it as though it were like one big uh, you know, mystery circuit. It's not really a mystery, actually. It's really just you put a Hadamard on each wire. So it's very easy to build with quantum circuits. But overall, it's doing some big capital N dimensional linear transformation, unitary transformation on this state. And, you know, later when we see the other kind of discrete Fourier transform, this discrete Fourier transform will be built of like a lot of gates. Well, big O of little n gates. So it'll be more complicated, but in this case, it's quite simple. And uh, so that's good. This is where um, the magic happens in some sense. And in fact, what comes out here is the sum over all S that index your pattern vectors of f hat s, s. OK, because this quantity, this number, is like the coefficient of you know, this, this vector coming in written in the chi s basis. But this is like the linear transformation that moves the chi s basis to the standard basis. So like here before, the state was kind of like sum over uh, s of f hat s times the chi s vector. But now this transformation like is the transformation that moves between the chi s basis and the standard basis. So that's why like it comes out and like you get the strength of the pattern as an amplitude next to like the name of the pattern or the index of the pattern. And then, you know, the last move Uh, the last move is usually just to measure. Again, I'll write one giant measurement uh, gate, although this is actually implemented just by little n measurement gates. But what comes out is, you know, a 2 to the n bit string, some s, just like the, the name or the index of a pattern, right? And it comes out with probability magnitude of f hat s squared. You said 2 to the n bit string? You mean n -bit uh, a little n bit string, yeah. N -bit string. Thanks, yeah. And this paradigm from like, I suppose like from here to here is called like the Fourier sampling paradigm. Like you loaded up some data vector by like encoding the two to the n values into the, the, the entries. And this piece like takes the Fourier transform or like converts it into like a linear superposition of like the strength of the s vector, uh, of the chi s pattern times, you know, just the, the name of the pattern, the indicator for the pattern. And then this samples one of these pattern vectors or pattern functions chi s with probability equal to the square of the the strength of that pattern. Okay, so like the patterns, chi s, that are like somehow like really present in F, have like a much higher chance to be output by this than the ones that have like close to zero strength in F. Okay. Any questions? This produces a lot of ancilla, right? Because on the left-hand side, we have capital N, and on the right-hand side, we have smaller? Uh, not sure what you mean, no. So it mainly has n, little n qubits that are going, there's like little n wires in this picture all the way through. Um, 
So like the function here, the capital function, f function you care about, you know, takes little n bit strings and outputs values. So it's, it's representing capital N different numbers, the capital N numbers in this truth table. But like the point is that this physical computation on these capital N numbers is happening with only little n physical objects, these little n photons. Uh, you mentioned the ancillas, it's like a little cheat because probably there are some ancillas going into here that are all zeros, but they also just come out here as all zeros. And the number of these is typically proportional to the number of gates in the classical circuit that you're using to compute capital F. But they don't really play a role in the computation otherwise, so I stopped writing them. Okay. Yeah, this is the beauty of like um, quantum. Like you're doing like some kind of sophisticated, you know, pattern finding operation on capital N, which is two to the little n numbers, which is like, you know, if, if little n is a thousand, that's like two to the one thousand numbers, that's like an extraordinary amount. Like you could not write that data down anywhere in the universe, but you only need a thousand photons together in order to like do this computation. You know, the drag is that like, unlike in the explicit case, you don't just get these like different strengths out or these frequency uh, strengths out. If you just do this, you, uh, what you get is like you get like a random name of a, a pattern with probability proportional somehow to the strength of that pattern. So it could be better than nothing. And really quantum computing is like, okay, well, what can we do with this one trick? And indeed, the first few examples of using this trick, they'll really be like, uh, like we have this trick. Let's just like invent a problem that like works real well for this trick. Where basically the whole point of the, the problem is that like by definition it can be solved well by this trick. So like the bernstein zorani algorithm we talked about last time, this deutsch, deutsch joza algorithm that I'll mention today, Simon's algorithm, which I'll talk about next time. They're all basically like, oh, what, is, what can we do with exactly this? And then the amazing thing was, like, after Simon's algorithm, like, sure, I noticed that you could do, like, an actually useful thing, um, basically using this paradigm, too. OK, so now I'm going to finally dive in. All of this, by the way, you know, could hold, this whole story works for any discrete Fourier transform, as long as you can implement it by a quantum circuit. So it can be this Hadamard one that we're going to talk about today. It can be the classic one with these e to the 2 pi i over n things, these complex numbers. So anything you know, that it's given by capital N, orthonormal vectors in CN, as long as you can implement the change of basis uh, transformation efficiently with a quantum circuit. But now finally, I will like, explicitly dive into the Hadamard one, which is the nicest one. OK, so let's look at this guy, the Hadamard transformation. OK, which is affected just by giving, putting a Hadamard on each of your qubits. This is, a, this is an a capital N by capital N unitary, where capital N is 2 to the little n. Um, and let me just, OK, I did the n equals 1 example before. Now I'm going to give you the n equals 2 example. So it's. This is the Hadamard, this is capital H. Okay, this is the n equals 1 example, but I'm going to tensor product two of them together. So if you remember how these Kronecker product works, you'll quickly come to this uh, computation. But otherwise, just take it for granted. I'll write it down. Plus one, plus one, plus one, plus one, plus one, minus one, plus one, minus one, plus one, plus one, plus one, minus one, minus one, minus one, minus one, plus one. Okay, that's the four by four case, the little n equals two case. And another thing that's like important to remember is like you know these rows and columns are indexed by not the numbers one through four, but by the two bit Boolean strings. Okay, so this is. The 0, 0 column, this is the 0, 1 column, this is the 1, 0 column, this is the 1, 1 column, this is the 0, 0 row, the 0, 1 row, the 1, 0 row, the 1, 1 row. I'm also going to usually write S, let, use letter S for the columns and letter X for the rows.
OK, so last time we actually gave or came up with like a formula for like how to sort of quickly write down this entry in the general little n case as a function of the column name and the row name. We didn't say it like that, but last time, I assure you, we did the following computation. Uh, you take this big matrix and apply it to a particular, let's say, column name, S. What is it? Well, we actually know that h takes 0 to ket plus and 1 to ket minus. So we could actually write it like this. Oops. Tensor. There's 1 for s2, 1. OK, so we kind of did this last time. We like imagined what happened if you expanded out this tensor product of n qubit states. And uh, this is what you got. You got 1 over root capital N times the sum over x and 0, 1 to the n of minus 1 to the xor sx. OK, what that's saying is like actually, so like h tensor n applied to s is kind of like asking about, OK, what's going on in the s column? And apparently what's going on is this. You'll see entries that you know, have a 1 over root n. That's stuck out front here. And then for each row, x, you have a sign, which is either plus or minus 1. And how do you get whether it's plus or minus 1? Well, it's given by this. It's given by the sx or applied to the string x. Yeah? Should that be times x inside the sum? Oh, yeah. Sorry, I dropped a times x symbol. Thank you. Good. And uh, this is the thing that we've been calling chi s. OK, where, just to remind you, chi s maps to plus or minus 1, and it maps x to minus 1 to the xor s of x. And just so we have it all on the board, remember uh, xor sx is the sum i such that si equals 1 of si xi, oops, just of xi mod 2. It's getting ahead of myself because you can also write this as sum over all i of si times xi mod 2. It actually is like the dot product between s and x in this vector space over the field uh, integers mod 2, which is on your homework. Uh, but actually, this way of writing it like, makes it clear, actually, that it's a symmetric quantity between s and x. And uh, well, that's actually captured in the fact that this is a symmetric matrix. I mean, the transpose of this matrix is itself. So it's the same as if you reverse the s and x labels for the rows and columns. OK. Um, good. So I'll do some examples. Oh, by the way, we actually kind of know a priori that this matrix is unitary because we actually built it out of like unitary gates. The Hadamard gate is unitary, and so the tensor product of Hadamard matrices is unitary. So we kind of like know in advance that like these columns are going to be orthonormal. But it's like an entertaining exercise to like prove that for yourself, like just knowing this formula. Um, but anyway, we know it. I mean, you can kind of see, right? Like if you take the dot product of two columns here, like half the time they'll be the same and half the time they'll be different. So like the entry rows products will half the time be plus and half the time will be minus. And so they'll add up to zero and therefore be orthogonal. Question. Mm -hmm. Just so that each entry in that table is just minus 1 to the power of xor of the two indices. It's a, a minus 1 to the power of like the dot product of these when you think of these as bit vectors. Yes. So for example, like, you know, 1, 1 dotted with 1, 0 is like 1 times 1 is 1, 1 times 0 is 0. You add that up mod 2, you get 1. So this should be minus 1 to the power of 1. Yeah. 
OK, good. OK, so let's like use this formula. This is like maybe the most crucial form of the formula. Let's plug in uh, s to be the all zeros string. Well, that's like uh, s has no ones in it. You're indicating like empty subsets. So the XOR of uh, nothing, or if s is all zeros, it's zero. So all of these entries will be plus. Or in other words, you're taking the first column. So uh, you get all ones. So you get this. And all the coefficients are plus one. And this is the uniform superposition, right? So this is like the trick that we used at the beginning of the whole like, story. If you put the Hadamard transform in all zeros, you get the uniform superposition. Uh, there's only so many examples you can do. But uh, if you put in all ones, well, that's like you're taking all of the, you're XORing all of the bits of x. So it's, we're root n, sum over all x of minus 1 to the parity of all the bits in x. Okay. And uh, I'll do like one more example, although it's like just more like a different way of writing the general case. One thing you can do is just like group together all the pieces where you get plus one here and all the pieces where you get minus one. If you do that, it looks like one over root n times the sum over all x such that s sort of dot x equals zero. This is mod two. x minus one over root n sum over x such that s dot x equals one of x. And uh, we're going to kind of use formulas like this later when we get into Simon's and Shor's algorithm. I mean, it's like a subspace of f2 to the n. It's like a, the analog of like a hyperplane. It's like all the things that are orthogonal to like a fixed vector s, you take them with plus. And all the ones that are not orthogonal to this fixed vector s, you take them with minus. Well, we're not going to use that for anything today, but I thought I'd write it anyway. OK, and finally, you know, when we, we fix this uh, Hadamard transform, I'll just remind you that, that uh, the strength of pattern, well, this parity XOR pattern in uh, G, which is sometimes written G hat S, or chi s inner product with g is uh, this. It's the fraction of x's such that uh, g of x equals this parity minus the fraction of x's such that g of x does not equal this. OK, we used to have that on this board. And um, this is a special property that uses the fact that these parity bit patterns, these XOR patterns, are plus or minus one valued. Okay. So, in particular, just to summarize everything one more time. Recall that if you, if you manage to cook up some vector g, you pass it through this guy, Hadamard on each gate, and then what comes out is this state. Uh, g hat s, s. And then if you measure, it gives the classical string s with probability, uh, I can just write g hat s squared. OK, 
Okay, and that g hat is given by this formula, assuming g, this is assuming g's range is plus or minus. Okay, so with this uh, whole story in place, like now I can just retell you what we did last class, but like in a more uh, expansive framework and not just like a magical calculation. So last lecture, we talked about the quantum algorithm due to Bernstein and Vazirani from 92. And you can make it somehow sound a little bit interesting by, by phrasing it like this. You know, it's, it's, a, it's solving a highly contrived algorithms problem, but like it's gonna do it in a cool way using quantum. So like imagine like someone gives you a chip, you know, Q sub F, implementing, quantumly implementing, some f uh, boolean function and they promise you and you believe them they promise you that f is actually an xor function but you don't know which okay well it's hard to imagine the circumstance arising but perhaps it arises Actually, I mean, we're going to be talking about there's a problem like this in your homework or a couple problems like this in your homework. And, you know, Simon's problem is going to be like this, where like somebody gives you a chip that computes some Boolean function, promised to have a certain property, and you have to find out something about that property. It all looks very contrived. But um, eventually, when this gets used in Shor's algorithm, it'll be a scenario where like you yourself built this circuit. Uh, and it does have some like magical property, but like you can't easily figure it out yourself, even though you built the circuit. I mean, the circuit is going to be something like computing like powers of like an integer mod another integer. And the property is going to be like the period of this as a function. It's like going to be like a periodic function. And it's going to be the case that like you built a circuit that computes the function, but like you don't actually know like what this mystery periodic property is. And so then you're going to use some quantum to like reveal it. But in like all these like uh, like warm up or these first few examples, like we just imagine that like somebody mysteriously gives you a function with some uh, a chip or a quantum circuit, really implementing a function with some property, and like your task is to figure out that property. So uh, you know, last time or one thing I blurted out at the end before we go straight to the quantum is if they just gave you this uh, chip and like you only could give classical inputs. I mean, if there's no quantum in the world. Then, I don't know, what are you going to do? Uh, you can plug in like x equals 1, 0, 0. And then what you'll learn, uh, you'll actually learn, it's still up here, you learn this every time, right? So you'll learn s1. And then you could plug in 0, 1, 0, dot, 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 0. Okay, and you learn s2. And you could plug in, at the end, um, this input, and you learn Sn. And great, and now you know S. OK, and it took you n applications of your mystery chip, which is not too bad. You know, n is supposed to be like a physically plausible number, so maybe it's a 1,000 or a million or something, so this is fine. Uh, it's also the case that if you're only going to use classical inputs, you can easily convince yourself that you cannot do it with fewer applications of QF. Why? Basically, you know, S is one of two to the n possibilities. I mean, S is described by an n-bit string. So like, you need like n bits of information out of this box. And every time you do a query, you only get one bit of information. So you need n applications of this box. In fact, it's, you can think about it even more carefully. Every time you do a uh, plug in an X, you get some linear equation on s. You know x because you plugged it in. These are coefficients. You get like a linear equation on the s's. And there's n unknowns. So you kind of need like n equations to figure out s. 
But you know, luckily this mystery person gave you a box that could accept superpositions as well, or gave you a, a chip that could accept superpositions. So with quantum, Well, first we saw that you know you could do this little trick, plugging cat minus into the answer register, and that gave you this sign implementation version of Q, of oh, right. Okay, and then you could do this this algorithm of you know putting in zero to the n, putting it through the Hadamard transform. Now you have the uniform superposition. Now you plug it into the mystery chip. Now you actually have what we would call ket chi s, right? Because f is xor s. And so, I mean, if this, in general, you get like f here, where f is the plus or minus one version of capital F, but we're promised it's a parity function, an xor function, so we get this. And then we put it through the Hadamard transform. And of course, what do we get out? Well, I mean, uh, we get the strength of pat each, you know, superposition here, where like for each s, we get the strength of that chi s pattern in the input. Well, in particular, that just means we'll get exactly this out. I mean, 100% of the strength is on this one xor pattern. Uh, good. And so then when we measure, it reveals S with 100% probability. And great. So with quantum, we did it with just one application of the chip. And that's pretty cool. Um, Okay, so I was going to do one more application, but I mean, I only have three minutes, so I'll just say it in words and we'll do it le next time. Um, yeah, so as I said, you know, once we, now that we have this like paradigm, this Fourier sampling paradigm under our belt, people implicitly like look for just, you know, uh, cool problems that they could solve using exactly this paradigm. And they're really trying to like make this difference even more dramatic. So n versus one is pretty cool, but still both of these are, you know, polynomial in n, I mean, they're both physically plausible. Um, so like, uh, I think the next year, or maybe it's actually the year, no, actually prior to this Bernstein Valus already algorithm, there was an algorithm by Deutsch and Joza, which is a very similar flavor. You're given like a Q of F implementing some F with promise to have some very special property and you have to tell something about it. It's quite simple, we'll see it next time. And there they actually showed that like a deterministic classical algorithm would actually need more than two to the n divided by two applications of the chip to answer the question. And that's like infeasible. This is an enormous number. But quantumly, you can actually, again, do it with one application and 100% probability. So this looks like amazing, like a super dramatic difference between the power of quantum and the power of classical. Uh, but it's like not super awesome because, as you'll easily see next time, if you allow yourself randomness, but still only classical inputs to this mystery chip, you know, you can also basically do it with like a couple of applications. I mean, it's literally like if you do T applications, you're correct except with probability uh, half to the T. Okay, so that's pretty great, right? I mean, you set T to be, you know, 100 and then half to the power of 100 is essentially negligible, so it's like 100. So this really separates the power of quantum from deterministic classical like amazingly, but that's sort of a Unfair comparison. We got nothing. We got no beef with randomness classically. Uh, so then the next thing, which we'll get into also next time, is Simon's algorithm. 
And Simon's is really great because this will be um, basically little n appli uh, applications of this mystery chip, classically. And even randomly, you'll need a square root of capital N, which is like 2 to the n over 2, or 1.4 to the n. And this is awesome, right? This is like a truly a separation between exponential time, or at least, at least usages of this mystery chip, and uh, n usages. So this is really showing like the powerful uh, power, the real power of quantum over classical, except in this like weird scenario of like a mystery person handing you a, like a chip. But finally, in Shor's algorithm, that mystery person will be you. You like build your own chip and like learn something amazing about the uh, the, the the properties of this circuit that you built um, with like a very small number of applications of your own chip. And we only know how to do it exponentially if you want to use classical computing. Okay, so we'll talk about this stuff next time.